Um, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Good, good evening for some of you. Um, welcome to the first edition of the GoTech webinar series on greenhouse gases and atmospheric, atmospheric composition measurements. Uh, I'm Valentina, uh, I'm the ES officer. Um, and today we have with us uh, Martin Steinbacher. I don't know if the pronunciation was, was correct. Um, from EMPA uh, in Switzerland. Uh, he will be giving a presentation on the importance of quality assurance and quality control for long term in situ atmospheric composition observations. Um, with us today, we have uh, Sonia from, from GoTech. Uh, Claudia from, from Go and IES member as well, and Faten, uh, she is a IES member. Um, so great that you all of you can join us today. We have 84 people, a lot. Um, regarding the, the code, of, code of conduct, uh, please be polite and respectful to the speakers and to all the participants today. Um, you will be mute and you, you, you can't access to your, to your video during the presentation. But if you have any question during the presentation, you can always leave, the, leave your question in the chat box. Uh, so Martin will be replying the questions afterwards. Um, we, will recording, uh, we are recording all the, all the contents of these webinars, the presentation, the chat box. Uh, and the, the webinar uh, will be available in some days, will be available in the YouTube channel of YES uh, and also in our, in our website. So you, if you miss some part, you can always watch, watch it again. And after, after this webinar and, the, and the, the, the three others webinar, the three other webinars of this of this series, uh, uh, an outcome report will be will be prepared and will it will be published online in in our website. So now I give the floor to I think Sonia. Oh, uh, Claudia first. Thank you, Valentina. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Good evening. Good afternoon. It's very exciting to see how many people from different parts of the world join us today. And I'm very happy to be here as well and would like to briefly start with the fact that atmospheric composition matters to many important problems that society is facing today. They are somehow many of them are related to atmospheric composition and its interaction with ecosystem, human health, weather and climate. And you can see here some of the important problems that we have and that we will probably continue to have. And we only know about whether how these problems are evolving, whether they get better or worse, if we have long term atmospheric composition measurements. And this is why we talk about this today. Within GOR, we measure six um, groups of variables, UV radiation, stratospheric ozone and the vertical ozone distribution, greenhouse gases, reactive gases, total atmospheric deposition and aerosols. And the total, this is about 60 variables. The Global Atmosphere Watch program of the World Meteorological Organization provides international leadership in research and capacity development in atmospheric composition through the long-term systematic observations of chemical composition and related physical characteristics of the atmosphere, quality assurance and quality control, and co-designed products and services of relevance to users. And GORE builds on the partnership involving contributors from 100 countries from all over the world and I would like to take the opportunity to thank everybody who contributes to the GOR program. And we can see some examples of stations here, but this is, of course, not all of them. So thank you very much. GOR is currently in the middle of its implementation plan. And the vision for the next decade of GOR is to grow the international network of high quality atmospheric observations across local to global scales to drive high quality and impact science while co-producing a new generation of research-enabled products and services. And for all of this, we, of course, also need communication and capacity development. And related to capacity development and gore I will now hand over to Sonia Böll, the gore coordinator. Thank you very much, and enjoy the webinar. 
Yeah, uh, thank you, Claudia. Uh, I'd like to introduce the GORTEC project to you. The Global Atmosphere Watch Training and Education Center called GORTEC is part of the GORE Quality Assurance and Science Activity Center in Germany and responsible for training and education of global and regional station personnel. The aim is to meet the GORE data quality objectives. The courses are held twice a year for two weeks and the topics include aerosols, UV, radiation, reactive gases, precipitation chemistry, greenhouse gases, and data evaluation. GORTEC is financed by the German Environment Agency, the Bavarian State Ministry of the Environment and Consumer Production, and the World Meteorological Organization. Next slide, please. <laughs> yes, uh, since 2001, uh, over 400 participants from 80 different countries have visited and were trained at the training center at the Environmental Research Station Schneetherner House, which you can also see in my background. Um, and the station is on Germany's highest mountain called Zugspitze. For more information, you can also visit our website. It's gortech.de. I think I will uh, hand on to Phaeton. Thank you very much, Sonia. Hello, everyone. It is so exciting as I love you to see you for the first edition of Gautech webinar series on greenhouse, in green, on greenhouse gases and atmosphere composition measurement, which is joint event between YES community and Global Atmospheric Watch GAO, program of the World Meteorological Organization, WMO. So thank you very much for joining us. Uh, thank you, Sonia, for the next presentation of Gauti, Claudia for introducing Gau. I'm Fatin Bahar, uh, ES Executive Committee member, and I'm glad today to give the presentation about ES Community, which is a network of early career scientists uh, who are presenting uh, the, the world. Uh, we are in a fine international multidisciplinary early career research in a powerful network and providing a voice and leverage for a better future to serve the society. Uh, YES has been officially endorsed by World Weather Research Program, WWRP, and World Climate Research Program, WCRP, the research arm of World Meteorological Organization, and we have close relationship with GAO. YES has several representation in international initiative and communities and organizations such as the Research Board of WMO, Future Earth, and etc. cetera. Uh, as you can see there, uh, in YES structure, we have the YES community and we have the YES council, the working group, the executive committee and the regional representative. Uh, we have four working groups. We have the membership working group, the science, the outreach and the online working, working group who is hosting this uh, webinar session today. And uh, we have uh, the regional representative and the executive committee which we uh, vote for them each, every year. It's usually between March and April. Uh, our active members from working group and from regional representative can join YES Council at any time. So uh, there is the website and there I, we share with you all uh, our social media. So if you have any question or inquiries, you can please contact us. And there we have the, your, our email address. And thank you for your attention now. Thank you for joining. And I hand over to my colleague, Sonia, to introduce the speaker of today. So thank you very much. Yes, our speaker today is Dr. Martin Steinbacher. He's a senior scientist at the EMPA Laboratory for Air Pollution and Environmental Technology in Switzerland. Um, his main duties are he's a principal operator of the Swiss national air pollution monitoring networks, air quality observations at the high altitude research station Jungfraunjoch. Or, um, he's also the manager of the Quality Assurance and Science Activity Center in Switzerland in support of uh, the WMO's Global Atmosphere Watch program. And he has also been speaker uh, at former Gothic courses we are very happy that you're here today, Martin. 
Um, I'd like to encourage participants to ask their questions in the chat box and uh, we can answer it after the presentation. Um, yes, Martin, the stage is yours. Okay, thank you. Let me share my screen. Do we see it? Yes, okay. Here we are, you can see it? Okay. Uh, thank you, Sonia, for the nice uh, introduction. Thank you, the GORTEC team. Thank you, the, the YES community. Thank you, the GORT Secretariat in Geneva for organizing that this webinar. I'm, I'm very pleased to be the first to, to give the opening lecture of the first webinar of its kind, of the first GORTEC webinar. Um, since it is the opening lecture, time is limited and the audience is most likely also pretty diverse. I do not want to go in too much detail, but I want to talk about quality assurance and quality control, things you have to consider when you want to do long-term atmospheric composition observations. And I split my talk in, in three parts. First, I want to talk about the design and station setup because achieving decent decent quality of your of your observations you you need to start already in in the preparation of the of your measurements then once everything is, is um, set up um, i will talk in my second part about the instrumentation and operation what's going on in the station and the third part is the data management and data processing part this can take either place at the station or somewhere centrally in the at the headquarters or in the, in the data processing unit. Um, I think I can mostly skip that since, since Sonia mentioned that already. I'm a meteorologist by training and uh, have a PhD in atmospheric chemistry and currently I'm the, the principal uh, investigator of the, of the majority of the measurements at the GORS station Jungfraujoch. I'm, I'm working for the Quality Assurance Science Activity Center Switzerland and I'm also chairman of the Atmospheric Monitoring Station Assembly of the European Integrated Carbon Observation System. For the ones that do not know Jungfraujoch, that's a, also a high altitude station at 3,500 meters above sea level in the Swiss, the Swiss Alps. It's part of the Swiss National Air Pollution Monitoring Network that is run by EMPA in collaboration with the Federal Office for the Environment. And as I said, it's also part of of uh, international uh, networks like the ICOS network um, that is focusing, focusing on, on harmonized greenhouse gas measurements across Europe. And Jungfraujoch is also one of the 32 global GOR stations that we can see here that are pretty much uh, distributed all over the globe. And my second duty is the, the Quality Assurance Science Activity Center Switzerland um, task where I'm mainly in charge of supporting stations in data sparse regions. Since in, in Europe and let's say in the Northern, Northern America, there's a, a very good coverage of air quality monitoring stations, but in some areas of the world, um, very important data is, is lacking. And that's why we try to support, here we see some photos from stations in, in Vietnam, Indonesia, Kenya, and, and Chile, for example. And how do, we, how do we support these stations? It's um, sometimes we provide instrumentation, but most of our duties are training. Here we see quite some impressions of, of training activities, either on site. Sometimes we have also um, technicians at, in Switzerland for training. And um, this year, since traveling, travel restrictions uh, apply, there are more and more. Um, also virtual virtual events like today uh, or another that's a photo of an, an, um, an event we had a month ago in in this indonesian colleagues and sonia mentioned the gore tech courses already empa is for uh, about 15 years a uh, long-term partner of the gore tech program and is is, is involved in teaching uh, especially when it is about greenhouse gases and reactive gases and um and training capacity building is an, is an important part of QSAC. And I also would like to mention Media Swiss here, acknowledge Media Swiss for funding of QSAC Switzerland. 
Um, okay, let's start uh, with the first of the three topics, design and setup. Um, some very basic questions you may you may ask yourself before starting to set up your instrumentation is why do I want to measure? Or why do I need to measure at all? That um, that brings you immediately to the, to the second question: Which compounds are of interest? Am I interested in in, in gaseous compounds, greenhouse gases, uh, classical air pollutants, in particles, dry or wet deposition? Do I want to make meteorological measurements? Yes or no? Um, then where are the measurements uh, reasonable? Do I want to measure up, upwind, uh, downwind of a, of a specific pollution source? Uh, when we talk about gore, which is by traditionally at least a more kind of a, a background measuring network, we usually we, gore tries to, to find um, sampling sites with a very with a best possible representativeness. That means usually background sites that are representative for a large area. That's why usually um, you want to avoid uh, sampling some, some local effects, uh, sources or things. Um, then what kind of data time series are needed? There you can, you can think of quite different approaches let's say satellites that, that screen the whole atmosphere. You can have a ground-based um, remote sensing um, instruments that look into the sun that can also measure the whole, the whole, uh, the whole atmosphere, atmospheric column. You can have mobile measurements on drones, on balloons, on airplanes. Um, you can have uh, towers, uh, fixed stations, uh, and so forth. And um, then you can also think about, do I need continuous measurements? Do I need only a spot sampling? Um, this is an, an example from, from flasks taken twice a month at the station in Indonesia, Bukit Kotatabang, from the NOAA flask sampling network. They have a flask sampling network uh, all around the globe, 50 or 60 stations. And with their two samples per per month. This is in our time series from 2004 to 2011, uh, seven years. Uh, you can see nicely the, the increase in, in CO2 um, as expected, as we can also see at other stations and some, some seasonality in the in methane that has to do with the with, um, rainfall patterns. Um, but in, in 2010, we installed a continuous CO2 analyzer there. And if we com compare the measurements there, this is now a 10 day period in May, 2010. Um, and in the red dots are the two flasks that are taken in that, in that episode. And you see, we, we get a very good match, but we can, we, can, we can learn other things here when we have the high quality observations. The long-term flask observations are very, um, cost efficient way to measure, well, to learn something about the global trends. If you, if you have a, a global network of these flash sampling um, networks, usually the flasks are taken on site and are sent then to a central laboratory, in this case to Boulder, Colorado. But if we, if we apply, uh, if we use uh, continuous high, high precision analyzers, we can also learn something. We see these diurnal cycles, that's the uptake due to the uptake by the vegetation during daytime and the release of CO2 during nighttime. Um, and then for sure, this is a much more costly approach because these analyzers are not very, very, very uh, cheap. Uh, but well, this is what, what I want to say here with that example that you have to make up your mind before what do you, what do you need, what you want, and then you can uh, choose your, your, your approach accordingly. And um, um, when is the right time to measure, especially when you do this flash sampling, do I want to sample every, every week at the same time of the day, or do I want to sample only once a month, but then five, five samples in the course of the day to learn something about the diurnal cycle? Do I just want to uh, sample, uh, uh, take air samples, during biomass burning episodes, whatever monsoon periods uh, and things like that. Um, here, 
I would just want to focus mainly focus on the ground based in situ observations. Uh, this is also my my main expertise, and this is also the I think the the most um, straightforward approach. Well, to start very basic infrastructure requirements, what, what do we need? Um, you need a shelter, you need a reliable power supply. In most of the world regions, you need also an air conditioning. All these instruments produce quite a lot of, lot of heat. Even if it's not too hot outside in a, in a little shelter, it will become pretty, pretty warm after some time. You need internet access to or data transmission and usually also for remote, remote access in case something something is not working as expected and you need uh, some some mast for free exposure of the inlet um, I, I will i will talk about the different reports that are available for where you can find useful information in in, in a couple of minutes but but here you see a, um, a quote from the from the uh, also measurement guidelines that say that laboratory building and inlet location should be best set upwind of any any local local source that may that may um, contaminate or interfere with your with your sampling. And um, this sounds well, more trivial than it is because sometimes we see also inlets like that because there's um, this is a photo where the, the, the orange little thing that's the inlet and you see there's just a tube was put outside of the window about 50 centimeters out uh, next to the wall of the of the, the measurement shelter um, and that, that was for ozone measurements uh, it, it is well that's definitely not perfect because also all it's depending on the wind direction it will be in the in the lee of the of the, the hut and also if the the inlet is too close to the walls, especially when, when you think of ozone. Ozone is very reactive. It can deposit on any surface. You may, you may have a, a loss of ozone when you measure at this, at this sampling site. And then we also changed the position here to the top, to the top on top of the roof. See, that's maybe not a very good, but that's a, a bad example. And um, something you also need to consider, especially when you want to measure CO2, because CO2 heavily interacts with the with the vegetation. If you measure it, a, it a heavily vegetated in, in a heavily vegetated environment, you should you should usually be well above the canopy, uh, because the as I said during daytime, uh, the up CO2 the vegetation takes takes up CO2 and releases CO2 in the nighttime. That's why often in um, they are kind of tall towers used and the air is drawn from the top of the tower into the shelter. You see somewhere a bit hidden between the bushes down there. Um, well, sounds also trivial access to the stations 365 days a year, but we have seen that this is, well, think of a, a mountain stations like the Jungfraujoch. Luckily there we have an an underground drain going up there and it access is always possible but in other regions you have monsoon you have landslides um, things like that if something fails and you have no access to the station this will cause some some troubles or will lead to some longer longer data gaps and either make sure that you have somebody on site uh, very frequently or some local support uh, Sometimes it's just to, to push a button to reboot the computer or something like that. It's very helpful to have somebody very close by who could, who could do some very, at least some very basic maintenance. And um, once the infrastructure is set, you need, you need instruments in periphery. And again, we experience when we support stations all over the world that often Money is available for, for the analyzer, but the rest, the other bullets are often kind of forgotten. You need some periphery for automatic calibrations. You need some valves that switch back and forth. You need a reference gas for calibration. You need pressure reducers that you can screw on, on, your, on your regulators. You need plumbing, you need tubing, you need connectors, uh, some, some rain protection for your inlet, uh, maybe a drying unit. 
and once all that is in place, you have you, you need also but, uh, running budget for consumable spare parts, backup instruments, etc. Um, okay, let's assume that the infrastructure is set. Go to we go to the next step. We try to to accommodate our 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 hut, um, install our equipment. And then the first question that comes uh, into play is which instrument, in, instrumentation to use. Um, but before I want to do that, I go one step back and um, I show a, a sketch from the GAW implementation plan that was already mentioned by Claudia that illustrates the GAW quality management framework. And um, I'm always pleased to show that because here we nicely see that the quality assurance science activity centers and the, the world calibration centers, EMPA is also hosting one of the calibration centers, is right in the, in the center of that quality management framework. Um, you have the core stations uh, at the bottom and you have central calibration laboratories that, that produce uh, reference gases, stations can, can purchase them and then Finally, data end up in the World Data Center, and there are scientific advisory groups that kind of oversee the overall um, performance. And there are also some uh, some expert groups that are even not shown here, or quite a number of expert groups that that also advise or set a bit the, the guidelines for the observations. Uh, and one of these expert teams. Or the expert community in this case, let's say, is the GHMT, the Greenhouse Gas and Measurement Techniques community that, that meets every second year and uh, produces a, a meeting report afterwards. And um, here is, you see the table that shows the recommendation, the recommended network compatibility goals for the main greenhouse gases. Um, and there, we see, for example, for CO2 in the Northern Hemisphere, we try to achieve a network compatibility goal of 0 0.1 ppm. Um, in the Southern Hemisphere, it's even more demanding by 0 0.05 ppm. Um, this network compatibility goal is, is, is defined as the maximum, um, the, the scientifically determined maximum bias that can be accepted uh, without um, jeopardizing, let's say, uh, flux inversions, uh, determination of source strengths of different um, different uh, greenhouse gases. And when you when you you may know that the constant atmospheric concentration of, of CO2 in the atmosphere is about 400 ppm. The network compatibility compatibility goal is 0 0.1 ppm. That means that's a, a less than a per mil. That's a, a quarter of a per mil. And why is that the case? When we look at, at some, some comp data compilations uh, made by the World Data Center for Greenhouse Gases in Japan, we see here in, in, in latitudinal slices the, the CO2 increase over the last uh, 30 years. And um, we see nicely this, this yearly wiggles when in summer, CO2 is mainly taken up by the atmosphere while it is uh, net, there's a net release in, in winter and in, in early spring. And it is not, not very well seen on the southern hemisphere because there's a less of land mass and less biosphere that can, can do that. And when we, when we take all these red lines from the left figure, we can plot that it, uh, in, a, in one, one consolidated plot. We see that there's a north-south gradient, but the north-south gradient is pretty small. And uh, from west to east, it's even smaller. And that's why we need to be very precise with our measurements to, to, to allow for, for sound, um, for robust um, changes, virtual spatial gradients in the, in the CO2 concentrations that are required to, to learn more about the sources and things. And that's why the requirements in terms of precision are so so demanding. Um, you may, you may, as a take-home message, you may you may recall that is a 
quarter of per mill precision that we try to achieve with, with the CO2 measurements. And then that's also another figure. Um, this is the, actually the basis for this the plot we have seen before. Um, these are all stations that report data to the World Data Center for greenhouse gases from the top from Alert in Northern Canada to South Pole at the bottom. And um, the color code is the CO2 increase over the last, um, that's now 50 years already. The red line shows the equator. That also illustrates that there are much less uh, time series available on the Southern Hemisphere than in the Northern Hemisphere. And uh, but you see the gradient is, is pretty, pretty small here. Um, that's a paragraph that um, comes next to this table we have seen before with the 0 0.1 ppm. Um, and well, it says that to achieve the required level of, of network compatibility, is, it's important to understand and carefully consider the design of the whole analysis system. This is what I, what I tried to mention before. Um, interestingly, well, no single instrument type is recommended because many can be used and none are foolproof. Um, for sure, there, there are instruments out there that perform better than others and they're more precise than others, but maybe even the most, the most advanced ones now are, it's maybe even too, too appealing to, to just put it out there, plug and play. It's, it's, they spit out some numbers, but without decent quality control and quality assurance, they won't, they won't uh, produce the, the data of the best possible, best possible quality. And finally, the last sentence reads here, a trade-off in instant stability and complexity versus cost must often be balanced according to the needs, resources, and challenges of the measurement program. That means even if you have a very, there may be very high-end instrumentation that is not, not too robust. And if it sits somewhere at a, at a very remote place where access is very difficult, maybe even maybe a better, a better choice to, to, to take something more robust that is maybe a little bit less uh, precise, but it can maybe produce a data with a much better data coverage. Um, for CO2, it is rather straightforward, let's say, but, but that's, that's an example here for, for tropospheric ozone where the data quality objectives are more, well, more tricky to define. That's a paper by David Tarasik um, from the Tropospheric Ozone Assessment Report that was published last year that we see on the leftmost column, we see the scientific task or question long-term tropospheric ozone monitoring, air quality model validation and whatsoever. And the second column here reads the goals and requirements. And that means depending on your scientific question, the requirements will be different. For long-term monitoring, it is about one nanomole per mole or one PPB. For air quality models, it is, um, it is there are different requirements, chemical data, gas simulation, satellite validation and, and so forth. That, that brings me back to one of my first slides where I said, before you start or before you purchase your instrumentation and you think about your, your, your measurement setup and your periphery, you should, you should define your main scientific aim. And depending on that, you have to choose the instrumentation and your whole setup. Um, okay, I mentioned, I mentioned some of these reports already before, the, the implementation plan. Uh, I also mentioned that the, the different experts groups that are, that are uh, existing and they, they produce quite some goal reports. Um, there's some experts workshop, there have been some experts workshop on NOx, ozone guidelines, GGMT reports, aerosol measurement uh, procedures, guidelines, recommendations, and there are many others. At the very end, you, you will find the, the web page where you can browse all that, all these reports. Um, in addition to that, there are other project reports, web pages, uh, ICOS was mentioned before, the European Integrated Carbon Observation System. There we, we compiled a very uh, comprehensive um, 
specifications document what we need and how we want to measure the uh, CO2, methane, and, and nitrous oxides, for example, uh, to the best, best possible degree. Um, the NOAA page uh, gives quite some useful information how they do their, their CO2 measurements uh, in Mauna Loa, the, one of the most uh, known time series uh, at all. Um, the environmental agencies, um, European Committee for Standardization, there are also quite some reports out there that, that provide some useful information about techniques uh, that can be used. Um, gives, they give some recommendations where you can learn a lot before you st really start and, and purchase your equipment. Um, scientific publications, plenty. Um, there are just a couple of uh, a few examples about uh, data processing, ozone particles, CO2 and nitrous oxides uh, techniques, consultation of peers, talk to your colleagues, go to conferences, have a chat with, with people that do similar uh, observations or observations and calls in similar environments as you, you want to do. Um, and again, don't forget the periphery. It's not only the, the instrumentation, the instrument itself, the analyzer that you need, but you also need um, the periphery to, for calibration and quality control. Um, traceability and calibration. That's again the example for CO2. I mentioned the central calibration laboratories before. That's for the greenhouse gases. This is uh, NOAA uh, in Boulder, Colorado. And they maintain a suite of 15 primary standards where they very precisely determine the, the, the CO2 concentration in it. And then they have a, a set of secondary standards where they determine the concentrations in comparison to these primary standards. And then they have uh, another level of, uh, of hierarchy of standards. And one set there here is called outside uh, the carbon cycle uh, group researchers and, and this one uh, can be can be purchased by, by by station operators and these will become then the primary laboratory standards and usually especially when you when you when you have a network of several stations these these standards are rather costly usually you keep a set of those standards in your in your labs in your central lab somewhere you assign numbers to another level of standards, and these are the standards that you use for for daily or well, for regular calibrations, let's say. And then again, that's a, a sketch from the ICOS uh, group. Um, you have the air inlets here somewhere, and then you need something, a valve that can choose automatically if you want to sample air or one of these calibration tanks for quality control. Now, the, all that is in place. You want to know how often you want you need to calibrate. Um, okay, maybe I can skip that due to the interest of time, but then um, we are here. How often do you want to calibrate? And for the, the, the newest generation of high precision analyzers that are usually also very fast, it is, it is common to do kind of Allen variance uh, tests. You just measure one tank for, in this case, more than 400 hours, let's say 10 days. And um, at the lower panels, you show the, you see the Allen deviation, that's the standard deviation. If, if in a perfect world, this, this line should come more and more down because you have more and more data to, to for averaging and then the, the the standard deviation would become smaller and smaller. But since there's drifts in the instrument, even if it's very, very little, usually you find a minimum where it's the best, where it is the best, um, the best performance achieved. And here a paper by a colleague of mine, Christoph Selrege, uh, based on these plots, we, we state here that approximately every 30 hours, this cavity enhanced laser spectrometer we used here should be should be calibrated. That was a laboratory test, and then in the field you can you can well, you can also gain quite some some experience 
Um, this is again from the ICOS network for one year calibration, uh, four different calibration gases for one year. Um, there was a change in the, in the calibration tanks in here in summer 2018. Um, here you see kind of the, the drift of the instrumentation. This is the difference of the measured value to the assigned value. That means the, the analyzer measures about one to two PPB higher uh, than, than, it, than the reality. But if you know that and you track that, you can, you can correct, you can easily correct for this. And um, here calibrations are only taking place every, every two to three weeks. But in addition, there are some target measurements done. Uh, a target gas is, uh, we see here in the, in the lower panel, um, in the upper panel, we see again three calibration gases measured every fifth day. And um, in addition to that, we have a target tank that is measured at least once a day for rapid um, detection of, the, of some instrumental artifacts. Because if you, if you calibrate here every fifth day or in the ICOS example, only every second week, you will only realize after 10 days or two, three weeks that there was something going wrong. And if you have one, one reference tank that is measured very frequently, um, this may need, may need to, can be of, of lower quality because it, it is just, you just want to want to track that uh, the, the signal is, is stable over time or, and the calibration, the calibration um, function that you apply to the data is, 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 is doing its, its job. Then you can, you could, the data should be on a, on a, on a straight line here. And to do all that, you also need some, some appropriate uh, data processing software. Um, CO2 was again, rather an, an easy case. Um, when, we, when we look uh, at other gases like ozone, ozone is a very reactive gas I mentioned before, um, cannot be stored in high pressure cylinders because it will, will vanish immediately. Um, for ozone, it's different. There, the reference is not uh, a suite of calibration tanks like, like uh, we had at NOAA, but they are standard reference photometers, all built by the National Instrument, uh, Institute for Science and Technology in the US. And there are about 60 of these NISTs out there, and they maintain the reference for core. And these 60, the 60 um, instruments, the SRP family, is, is undergoing um, regular key comparisons organized by the BIPM in Paris. And there we, we ensure that all these, these uh, reference photometers uh, measure the same. And then when you want to calibrate your ozone instrument uh, in the field, usually you need a, a standard, um, a transfer standard that is compared to one of these reference uh, photometers. This is here a, a schematic from the World Calibration Center uh, run at EMPA. And then we use the standard uh, transfer standards. Uh, we bring it to the, to the station and we, we make a comparison there. And this, is, this is what uh, the World Calibration Center EMPA does uh, with that uh, regular audits for, for now nearly 20 years. And there you see that we visited already quite some stations all around the world uh, doing these, these calibrations. But, but usually measurement networks with having its own transfer standards and have access to the standard of reference photometers can do exactly the same. Okay, last part, um, data management, management and data processing. Once the, measure, the measurements are done, you need to to process the, this data. Um, you should start with an overall concept. How do you get the data from your instrument to a central computer on site usually? How can you transfer the data preferably automatically to, to another server where, where people that, that process the data can access it? You have to think of a, a backup, 
back, uh, backing up the data. Um, data visualization, um, preferably on site already for the for the operators that they can uh, go through the data of the last since the last visit easily. And then finally, um, you can make the data available at the at the World Data Centers, for example. And this is a, a nice um, sketch from from Lynn Hassan, also from the ICOS network, um, that I like. Uh, quite a lot uh, that, that shows that usually you start with raw data, you do some, some automatic um, filtering. Let's say you also record uh, the instrument pressure, the, the, the temperature of the measurement cell or whatever. You do, some, you do some flagging and then you have to split this data in your, when, when calibration gas was measured, when, when ambient air was measured and when these target data were measured. And then you, you need to filter, um, you need to, to account for the stabilization. Um, and then these calibration data need again to be applied to the in-situ data and the target data. Um, this we can see, for example, here. Um, this is, uh, we started to measure ambient air and then we switched from air to port two, port four, port, port five, six, eight, and back to air. It means we measured five different um, high pressure cylinder, high uh, reference gases. And then you see the, the red data are the ones that are uh, rejected because then it usually takes some time after switching the valve, it takes some time till the signal is, st is stabilizing. And then only the, the, the second part, um, is used for, for determining the, the, the reading of the instrument when a gas that was connected to port six, let's say, um, was measured. And you need to record along with the, the concentrations of your analyzer, you also need to report the valve position that you know at which point in time, uh, which, which reference uh, source was, was measured or if ambient air was measured. And all that is usually um, it, it urgently calls for some some automated software and no no spreadsheet uh, solution. Um, well, this is what I said here. Automated processes uh, are encouraged, um, facilitates diagnostic and quality control, and also allows for easy, rather easy reprocessing of the data. Like I said. NOAA hosts a suite of, of calibration gases, and sometimes they they they, have, they need new suites because they also run out, and and their scale changes, and then stations are are asked for a reprocessing of all their data, and then it is really helpful when these things were done uh, kind of automatic with some automatic procedures. Um, estimation of measurement uncertainty. Some people say that measure data without uncertainty are, are useless. Um, that's well, this is maybe a web webinar of its own uh, measurement uncertainty, but uh, just to give you a, a little a small, a short flavor, there's a guide to the expression of uncertainty in measurements, GUM, uh, again, available via the BIPM. Um, that is, well, for an atmospheric scientist, that's sometimes uh, a difficult read, but it's, it's, very, it's very useful to also look into these documents once um, to learn a lot um, how this can be done. And um, in, the, in the ozone measurement guidelines uh, mentioned before, we, we did that um, in 2013. Um, there we had a, a couple of issues we identified like uh, drifts, span drift, zero drift, readability, influence of change in temperature, pressure, water vapor interferences. And then we had some, some best guesses, some expert judgments. Sometimes you can, you can run some tests to determine, to, determine, um, to quantify the, the effect. And then we came up with a, with the equation we can see here, 
that determines the uncertainty of your ozone measurements depending on your, on the concentration. And um, we could luckily we could we could also prove that with some experimental experimental data. This is again from the Swiss National Air Pollution Monitoring Network that I mentioned before. Here we see the intercept versus slope. There you can imagine that we we, we make scatter plots of the the measured values versus the, the assigned values. And then if you get some intercept slope pairs and you apply the, 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 the equation we can see on the left, all data should, or 95% of the data should lie within this, within this gray shaded area. And there we see that this was very well um, confirmed by real, real measurements, uh, real calibration set. The, the estimated uncertainty we, we determined in that report uh, definitely makes sense. Okay, um, time is running up. Very briefly, the GOG program also recommends the adoption and use of internally accepted methods in the vocabulary, that everybody uses the same vocabulary um, when talking about the same things. There's a, the, the VIM, the, the International Vocabulary of Metrology, um, rather lengthy, difficult to read, let's say, but um, we, the QSX Switzerland, some years ago, um, and we, we regularly update that, uh, produced a, a glossary that can be can be found at our webpage. That is a chosen subset of the, the vocabulary in the, the BIPM report and also illustrates or explains some of these, some of the terms with some uh, GAW specific uh, examples. Okay, data management. Um, on site, I mentioned that data visualization is important, that this is now a screenshot of a, of a setup in at one of the stations we supported in, in Vietnam. There you can see the time series. You can easily switch back and forth. You can go back in time to see how the data looking like uh, yesterday. It's, it's more than just checking this, the, the little display on the, on the instrument uh, instantaneously. Um, then there we have a, a logbook for data management, very important. Um, and then at the central data processing unit, you need other tools that can at least semi-automatically split the data as I, as I mentioned before. And there you can have some more sophisticated solutions like this one. That was something where we had also some automatic filtering inside or you can also just use some script language um, that is maybe less, less, well, less visualizing the data. But um, if you know what you do, that is that also does a very, very good, decent job. Um, okay. Well, that's that's actually trivial. You should document everything you do. You can use a, a very simple a very simple uh, notebook to, to write that down. You can also use pen, pen and paper, but make sure that you, you make backups, your photocopies or whatever, and preferably for sure you have that in a digital form that you can also transfer that on other computers. And there are also other um, more, more advanced versions for free. This is called eLog where you can, you, you can you can predefine some categories like the author, the type, which instrument uh, your, your logbook entry is is referring to, and then you have already some of the some of the basic information um, selected just by using these pull down menus. Well, checklists is also trivial. Usually, have have your have some checklists or prepare your own checklists what to, to do every week every month every six months and then well just step by step we, we prepared some step by step um, 
uh, explanation how to do that. And this is very helpful that nothing becomes forgotten. Um, regular updates and courses, score station and information system. That's the metadata repository where, where all, all metadata should, should be easily found because um, Claudia mentioned the, the six focal areas of Gore, and there are also five or six different uh, data centers. Um, but here you should actually you should find that uh, that should be the place where you can find all information which data is available where, and also data um, responsible persons are are listed here. But for sure these these kind of things need to be updated regularly by the station operators themselves. Um, I think that's the last thing. Additional quality control. They are try to participate in comparisons like round robin exercises. With God, there are different uh, round robin exercises that are well ongoing again and again. Um, that will 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 help to. For, for comparison, if, if, well, if your data are, 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 are sound or accurate. And then a very easy thing is just compare your data with data from other similar stations. And for illustration, I show again that CO2 north-south gradient. If you, if you measure some, something that would be labeled in blue, like, like say, uh, let's say 360 parts per million, in 2010, then you would easily see that something is most likely going wrong with your, with your measurements. And there are also many online tools available in the, in the web for trajectory calculations. This is very helpful for, for, data, for data interpretation, uh, where you can kind of get a, an easy feeling where, where your air, ma air masses were coming from when, when you sampled. Um, this is uh, especially of interest when you have, a, let's say, um, that's, I think that's for a station in, in South Korea on Jeju Island, where usually you measure clean air when it comes from the ocean. But if the wind is turning and uh, air mass come from the continent, you may, you may see some uh, elevated concentrations. And this is some easy some easy visual um, support and then and you want to interpret your data if if specific peaks in your time series can be real or should could be likely measurement artifacts okay let's conclude um you have seen similar thing already before this is what you need in terms of infrastructure this is what you need in terms of instruments and, and periphery. And um, that's a, a sketch uh, we prepared some years ago that shows if, if you want to measure, you do not only need the blue analyzer in the shelter here, but you need also the, the reddish calibration facilities, computers that to make, to produce uh, decent data that can be sent to the central data uh, repositories. And before you start, you should clearly define why you want to do that. This will, this will help you identify the data quality objectives. Once you know how precise you want to be, you can, you can, you can find uh, the suitable instrumentation. Then you should design your, your operation calibration strategy, um, prepare some standard operation procedures, checklists, um, Troubleshooting strategies: How can you fix problems once they will they will appear? Um, for the data, you need a robust data management, and well, that's all for sure. Uh, is involved in costs. You should have a sustainable budget, because as I said, this is can be rather costly, and you need to support. You have to have some convincing arguments to that to get decent support from your funding agents. Okay, this is I will I will stop here. These are some of the references of the of the of the resources I, I have shown before. Um, and I would like to thank you out there for your attention.
So thank you, Martin, for your presentation. We collected some questions in the chat box and I'd like to read out the first one. Uh, what is the minimum data period that can be used to obtain a trend or perform trend analysis? Yeah. Well, if you have two measurement points, you can draw a line and then you have a trend. <laughs> you measure once in 2010 and once in 2020, and then in theory, in theory you could determine a trend. But, well, the, the, the real answer is, well, it depends on the, the trend, on the strength of the trend, on the precision of your analyzer. For ozone, for example, it, it's about 10 years, let's say, I would say. And CO2, CO2, we have a, a very significant trend of about two ppm per year, but then you have every year you have these vehicles up and down due to the biosphere that are on the order of, well, depending on the station, on the order of 15 to 20 ppm. Um, well, then you, for sure, then you can do some, some, some calculate the annual, you de-seasonalize de -seasonalize your data, but also there you need a couple of years of data. It's different. It depends on the parameter, on the trend, and on the precision of your instrument. Thank you very much for the presentation and for answering the questions, Martin. The next question is, um, for example, for calibration of a thermal analyzer of SO2 using a gas tank, what is the suitable period of calibrating the SO2 to be stabilized with time? Okay, well, we do that every couple of days. And um, finally, if, if you do that, if you do that every day or every second or every third day, it doesn't change much because once you do that so frequently, you do not, you do not want, to, want to do that manually. That means you need some, some valve, some, some calibration box that can do that automatically, or you can, that, a programmable box that can switch automatically between calibration gas and, and ambient air. And then it doesn't matter if you do that once a day or every second day, it is more a matter of calibration gas that you need. And usually we, we suggest to, to start more frequently. And then after a couple of months, you see if, if, if it's, if there's no, no real change in the instrument sensitivity. In a perfect world, the instrument sensitivity does not change at all, and then you do not need to calibrate. But for sure, it just depends on changes of atmospheric pressure, pressure in the in the instrument, temperature in the lab, temperature in the instrument, whatever. Um, some dirt on the inlet filter, where the well, there. The thousands of reasons why instrument sensitivity can change and instrument sensitivity does change. And that's why usually to be in the safe side, you do it even more often than it is even needed. Every couple of days, let's say. Thank you very much for the presentation, Martin, and for answering the question. Uh, we have a third question, uh, which is saying how to decisionalize the data are there any read-made tool available for performance trend analysis? If the measurements are not part of the GAO network, can we get support for quality controlling? Well, yes, there, there are algorithms out there. Usually I do most of the data analysis with R it's kind of a little bit similar to MATLAB, but R is even for free, open source. And there, and at least there, I, I know it best. There are many packages that are also freely available. You can download, you can go to the uh, CRAN, Comprehensive R Archive Network, and there you can search for whatever 
whatever um, um, passwords. Um, it's yeah, well, uh, and well, there are several approaches out there that are freely available. You, usually, a, a good thing is to to also check again the literature, and usually, if it's the paper is well documented, it's usually even the function is made sometimes um, mentioned um, or at least it refers to a specific package of a software tool that can that can do that that has nothing really to do with score that's kind of a, a basic a, a basic uh, problem that is that was already targeted thousands of times Thank you. Um, the next question is, does frequent calibration mean frequent instrument adjustment? That's a good one. No, it doesn't mean that. <laughs> um, if I have a whole day to teach, I usually I show some examples. It is even not recommended to adjust the instrument parameters every time. We, we rather suggest to track the sensitivity and the sensitivity changes with time and then you can you can fit some low pass filter let's say uh, through the through the, the the background signal of the instrument or the, when you apply a specific concentration because often it's go a little it goes a little bit up then it goes a little bit down and if you change the and you can easily correct for that afterwards with some um, suitable tools if you change the settings every time you will get some steps in your time series and then if you want to correct afterwards you have to do that slice wise for every every time you change the the parameters uh, really on the hardware we do not recommend that at all Thank you very much, Martin. We have another question coming from Noah. And the question is saying, if we have a long-term site set up, MT Bachelor in Oregon, United States, where we are measuring the O3 and the suit of another compound since 2004, how might we become a part of the GAU network? Okay, well, that's more a question for Claudia, that, but the short one is you, you visit the WMO webpage and there's an application form. And I don't know, Claudia, if you want to add something to that. Usually there, there, well, there are requirements. Usually there are requirements in terms of, of data um, release, at least once a year or six months after having made the measurements. I don't know, Claudia, you want to add, add something to that? Yes, I think um, that's pretty much summarized it. There's uh, instructions on the website which um, explains very well uh, what needs to be submitted. I'm, I, I will post the website in the chat in a moment. And uh, then you submit an application and then it will be evaluated by the scientific advisory groups. And like, and then you will hear back. So that is the uh, um, the way you can join. Um, the data has to be made available um, to the World Data Centers. So um, that would be an important part of it. And there are some other requirements that I think it's easiest if I post the link in the chat. Uh, just give me one moment. Thank you. And it's a very good idea to become part of the GOR network. Yeah, maybe we can take the last one. And the last one is saying, are there metrics to evaluate the instrument sensitivity? Well, you, you take a reference gas and you know there's 414.5 ppm of CO2 in it and your instrument measures only 412.7 ppm, then you know that you are 2.2 or whatever, 2.2 ppm off. That's, and then you, well, in very easy words, well, you do that with several calibration tanks usually, 
and then you can determine a calibration function and then you correct for that. Is that, oh, I think, well, that's the, the, the fast answer, let's say at least. And the more calibration gas you have, usually the calibration gas should span the whole range of, of atmospheric uh, concentrations you, you observe. Um, some, sometimes sensors are nonlinear, then it becomes kind, kind of more, more tricky, but this can be also uh, investigated when, when applying several, several calibration gas of known concentration. Thank you, Martin, for the great talk. And thank you all attendees for the fruitful discussion and the great questions. I give the floor to my colleague Valentina to close the session now and make the announcement of the next webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Patent. Thank you, Martin, for your presentation. I think uh, a lot of people had great questions. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm happy to see uh, everyone asking uh, in the chat box. So now I want to present you the next webinar will be next next week uh, next monday uh december 14th uh at the same time as this one uh 2 p.m utc i'm copying the link uh if you want to register in the chat box uh we also make the uh, proper announcement in in yes social media and the speaker will be andrea kaiser white uh she she will be talking about modeling of air masses impacts of corona lockdown so you are more than welcome to to join us next week um well see you in one week and thank you again martin for your time and your great presentation uh, and if you have any other questions to all the attendees you can reach us uh, and i think that's it have a great night or great afternoon or day depends on which part of the world you are bye everyone Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you all. Bye-bye.